Now, last week, we examined the false teachers that were plaguing the church in Crete. These men were primarily Jewish in background, legalists, guys that were creating commands of men and binding them to the church. Legalism is like building a fence around Jesus and choking off access to him and the salvation that he provides. <clears throat> but these teachers were not just legalists. They were also morally compromised by the Cretan culture. Liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Through empty words of Jewish myths and deceit, they were destroying the faith of whole families. All for sordid gain, either for gain to gain control and power over the congregation and people, or to gain filthy money. Paul said this about them. Chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and the unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Paul says, to, to the pure, all things are pure. What that means is that God has made you acceptable to him by the blood of his son. You are pure from the inside out. You have full access to him day in and day out. You're no longer to have to evaluate your daily activities for ceremonial cleanliness like under the old law. John, you can touch a dead body and you still can be right with God. You can have a rash or leprosy and still be right with God. You can eat an alligator camel bear carp sandwich and still be right with God. You can be an uncircumcised Gentile and be right with God. But if you don't believe in Jesus, your whole life is defiled. Nothing is pure. No access to God whatsoever. And as a result, you are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work of God. These men were unfit for good works because they did not believe in Jesus. They don't know God, even though that they say they did. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul said this to the Philippian church. He said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. A Christian has work to do in regard to your salvation, not to earn it, but because of it. God is working in you. He wants to use you for his good pleasure, but you have to resist your fleshly desires and the darkness that is innate in your human nature so that he can have free reign over your life. Now, putting away selfish, selfish desires is not easy, but it is what we must do because of what we have been given. So between last week's section and this week's section, we need to see a shocking difference between the false teachers and the church. Difference between unbelievers' behavior and believers. It should stand out. Our lives should stand in stark contrast to the culture that is around us, uh, just like the church in Crete. So beginning in chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, 
kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, not showing, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of our God, our Savior. <clears throat> so chapter 2 starts out with, But as for you, Titus, this is to contrast his job against the false teachers who were destroying the church. They were doing this, but as for you, teach sound doctrine. Paul's instruction is for, T for Titus to speak healthy teaching. Healthy teaching in, healthy, te or healthy faith out. Now this passage, we're going to examine Paul's instructions uh, that help Titus set in order not just the elders, but the rest of the congregation. Everyone in Crete has been affected by the culture that they live in. Liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. It is impossible to not be affected by the culture that you live in. You and I are affected by the one that we live in, and not for the better. So these instructions are given as guidelines of what to do about it, how to live in the face of that culture. Uh, they were originally for the people in Crete, but they're equally important for us today. Now this list is broken down into gender, and age, and social status. <clears throat> now I said from the beginning of the class that we need to be very careful of lists uh, for two reasons. Behaving like a Christian without believing in and appreciating what Christ has done makes you a hypocrite. Just like the false teachers from the last chapter. We must not lose sight of the fact that, that we behave this way because of what Christ has done for us. The gospel must motivate our lives, the reason for the way we act. The other thing that we must be careful of is that legalism does not take hold. When God gives instructions to behave a certain way but does not define exactly how to accomplish that, then it's left up to the individual to figure it out in their own life. What works for me may not work for you. And I can share with you my experiences and my recommendations for a godly life, but I cannot demand the specifics of it on you. If what works for me is bound upon you as law, then that's legalism. A command of men or a command of Josh, Josh, just like the false teachers were doing. This is the whole passage that I just read. And I highlighted three words. The main idea behind all of these instructions is being self-controlled. That is, that is the umbrella that covers everything that is talked about. Cretans were known for not controlling themselves in any way. Uh, one of the commentators I read said that there was an ancient saying that there were no wild animals on the island of Crete naturally, so the people took over that position. Cretans were known for not controlling themselves. Liars don't control their tongue with truth. Evil beasts don't control their passions with righteousness. Lazy gluttons don't control their appetites with any discipline. Now Titus has been tasked with teaching actual Cretans and us self-control. Putting the fleshly desires in check. This is what Paul is talking about when he told the Philippian church to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We have work to do in regard 
to self-control. It's personal work. I cannot do it for you, and you can't do it for me. But the more selfish and sinful garbage that we can get out of our lives, the more God is going to be able to work through us each and every day. So first, starting at the top with the old men. Verse 2. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Being sober-minded uh, is sometimes translated temperate. You may have that in your translation. We use the word temperate uh, when, mostly when we're speaking of a climate. You can say that Michigan is a temperate climate. Uh, we have some hot days in the summers and some cold in the winters, but not the extremes like you find at the equator or the poles of our earth. So keep... So keeping the mind under control is the idea. Clear thinking is the key when we say sober-minded. Elderly men are supposed to be dignified. This means to be worthy of respect. Someone that you can look up to. Being respectable can be affected by any number of things. Uh, but much of it is outward in appearance. Things that other people observe and desire to be someday. Clarence Floyd, years ago, probably 20 years ago, came up to to and told me and gave me some good advice. And he said, live your life in a way that you're never disqualified for the eldership. That is a, that is a request for a young man to seek after a dignified life. Self-control is the next thing that Paul says. Old men are to be self-controlled. This means curbing one's own desires. We must live for God and not for self. These behaviors are all interrelated. Being in control of the mind, in control of the body, in control of your actions. And then Paul goes on, but also... Older men need to be sound. They need to be healthy in three aspects of their life. They need to be healthy in their faith. Old men need to be rooted in their faith, unshakable in their confession of Christ and the gospel that they obeyed, like a mighty oak that is unswayed in the wind. They need to be sound and healthy in their love, love for God, love for neighbor, and love for self. And they need to be steadfast. Older men, God expects you to be capable of patiently enduring trials. <clears throat> Those younger than you need to see you weathered and worn from the hardships of life, but not broken. It is a big ask, but it's asked of all of us. Next up is the older women. Verses 3 through 5. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Paul begins this section on, with older women, and he says, likewise, likewise. The responsibility of right behavior is no less on females as it is on males. There is an equal share of responsibility when you've been washed in the blood of Christ. And the text says that older women must be reverent in behavior. What's it mean to be reverent? What do you guys think it means to be reverent? It means sacred before God. This is the only place in the whole Bible that this word is used. It, it, it was common in secular writing at the time, in ancient Greek, 
And the way it is used in the secular writing, it, it refers to conduct that is appropriate to a temple. This is very appropriate for what we are. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple? When God purified us with the blood of his son, he removed, removed all of the pollutant sin so that his spirit could dwell within us. Just like God dwells with his glory in the tabernacle in the temple in the Old Testament. Because of this great blessing, our behavior should be reverent, it should be sacred to God. It should be befitting of a temple worthy of indwelling. And our actions should not continue to pollute something that God has cleansed with the blood of his son. Now it appears that older women of Crete struggled in two areas in their life, polluting their bodies slandering and being slaves to much wine. The word slandering is diablos in the Greek. It's a, an adjective in our text and it describes the attributes of the older women there. It, it means that they were false accusers and malicious gossips. Now to put this in perspective of how bad this really is, when that same word is used as a noun, it's translated the devil. It's the name of Satan, because he is a slanderer by nature. You cannot expect God to dwell his spirit in you while you are behaving like the devil. It doesn't work that way. Paul also said that the older women in Crete were slaves to much wine. Uh, they were under bondage to it. They were enslaved to it. I think this contrasts well with what Paul said in the introduction. He was a bondservant of God. He had placed himself under the control and the mastery of God's will. But these older women in Crete were under the control and the mastery of much wine, and it should not be so. Now, the women of Crete are to be reverent with conduct that is appropriate to a temple. And as such, Paul said, teach what is good. Who are these older women supposed to teach? The younger women. About what? Loving their husbands and loving their families. To love their husbands and their children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands. I, uh, I, I know a young preacher who, who came into a congregation years ago and taught a class on marriage. Uh, he, had, he had been married for a couple of years, but the audience that he was speaking to had been married for 30 plus years. And the audience had experience with the ups and downs of marriage. They had experience in love and war at home and then deeper love again. They had enjoyed monumental success and tragic losses in their marriages. So every time that he tried to counsel them, it almost came across as laughable, like a child telling a parent how to adult. And they said, we've been there, we've done that. He had good intentions, but no experience to give advice to veteran married couples. A similar thing is going on here in our text. This is a special category of teaching that comes with experience that men in general do not possess. Titus was not supposed to mansplain to the young ladies how to run a household. Older women, it is your job. Teach the young women what it takes. You've been there. You've done that. Share what worked with your marriage and your home and what didn't. Loving your husbands, being submissive in the marriage in the biblical sense, loving your children and managing the home, all while being self-controlled, pure, and kind. You have a wealth of knowledge. Make sure that you share it. Why are the older women to teach the younger women in this way? 
What's the text say? So the word of God will not be reviled. That's your job. That's why this teaching is so important. The, the word reviled is the word blasphemed. To speak evil against God's word. We're going to see this idea repeated in verse 8 and verse 10. So it's not exclusive to the older or younger women. But the point being made is, is that what we do and how we live gives testimony to the hope that we have. People are watching you. If we have been made pure on the inside by the blood of Christ, a temple worthy of God's indwelling, we cannot live like our body is a bar room or a brothel. When we live that way, the curb appeal of Christianity is taken away. We look just like the world, and we cannot live, give the world one inch to speak evil of God's word. So our homes and our marriages, our child rearing, our self-control should reflect Christ into the world. That's a heavy task, older ladies, but it's the one that the Holy Spirit has given to you. Verse 6, likewise, urge the young men to be self-controlled. The young men get one instruction here, self-controlled. This is the theme of all of the instructions. It is the umbrella that covers all the others. So the young men are not getting a pass just because it's only one sentence. Do you remember the man that was possessed by the demon named Legion? In the Gospels, it's recorded in Mark and also in Luke. And in that passage, the demon-possessed man, he approached Jesus, and they have a quick conversation. Jesus evicts the demons from him and sends them into a flock of swine, which eventually runs down a hill and is drowned. In Luke chapter 8, verse 29 and 35, the Bible records this from that passage. It says, for he, Jesus, had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he, he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. In verse 35 it says, after Jesus had cast the demon out, it says, the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So this man was completely out of control, possessed by a demon, driven by demons, and not by himself. But after Jesus booted Legion out into the, the swine, the man was found in his right mind. That is the same word that's used in our passage for self-control. The people that came to see Jesus found the man self-controlled, opposed to demon-controlled. Now Paul is not talking about demon possession in our passage, but the point is clear. Young men suffer from not thinking clearly. Sometimes they lack the mental and the emotional composure that others would desire them to have. They can be easily distracted. They can be impulsive. And I know this from personal experience. I could give you examples, but I'm not going to. If a young man is going to grow up to someday be an old man, and possibly an elder in the church, it is imperative that they have self-control. Now, Paul seems to transition to Titus specifically in the next verse. Some of the commentators suggest that Titus fell into this younger man category, so it naturally flowed to him. Verse 7, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing to say about us. 
Now, Paul tells Titus in all respects, in every category, be a model or a pattern of good works. The good works are not defined here, yet it is contrasted against the false teachers who were wrecking the church in the previous chapter. <clears throat> Paul said that they were unfit for any good work. They were rotten on the inside. They were defiled and detestable, unbelieving and unfit. Titus was supposed to counter that. Everything that the false teachers claimed to know but never did. Titus was to live out his life, his Christianity, in a practical way, modeling it for others. He was a believer. He had been purified. He had been filled with the Spirit. And all of his life, in every category, was to be diffused with the godliness that flows through the Holy Spirit, perfectly suited for good works. The primary work of his preaching and teaching uh, is explained and addressed here. It says, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. <clears throat> the instructions that Paul gives Titus is not really related to the content of his teaching as much as Titus's character in doing it. Why is it so important that Titus exhibit integrity, dignity, and sound speech in his teaching. <clears throat> Remember, Titus, Titus has been sent to, to silence false teachers. Rebuke them severely. You cannot do that kind of thing when you are morally compromised yourself. This brings us back to the importance of the attributes and qualifications of an elder. Because what Titus was going to do is what the elders were going to need to do. Titus's behavior, along with the elders, were to be blameless, unimpeachable, but not sinless. You cannot be morally compromised and reprimand the church. Oh, it just does not work that way. See, there's always going to be who? Titus? I don't know that. If you can't remember, then I'm not going to be able to remember either. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know that. There's always going to be people who oppose Christ people who oppose his teaching, people who oppose Christ's people. And, and our conduct should be so in line with godliness that we, when we are attacked for what we believe because of Christ, it is the opponent who is shamed and not Christ himself. That's the goal. Now, verse, verse 9 Paul goes on and he says, Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Now Paul has addressed the entire church by gender and age. No one is, is left out in this teaching. Old men old women, young women, and young men. And now he switches to common societal relationships that were found in the church, bondservants and slaves. Whenever we come across passages about slaves, I think we have two reactions. First, we cringe uh, because we hate slavery. The, the context uh, of our history is framed by racial division and war and we hate it. The other reaction that we have is that we ignore it. It's a flyover passage because, well, I'm not a slave, I've never owned a slave, and so it doesn't have anything to do with me. Technically, that's true. Uh, but the principle behind it may apply to your life just fine. In the Roman world, 
there was many reasons to be enslaved to another person. Uh, none of them had anything to do with race or, race or ethnicity. One of the ways that a person could become a slave was because of debt that they could not pay. Uh, I know everyone here knows something or another about debt, whether you hold a mortgage or a car loan or you're late on your taxes to the federal government. You probably have some debt. And things like that, when not paid in the Roman world, could be resolved by becoming a slave to your lender. The Romans called that nexum in the Latin. Uh, debt bondage. Now, while I am not in default and I am not enslaved to anyone, there is a sense by which I must go to work to pay my mortgage. Because of this, I personally view my work this way. I treat my boss and my lenders in the same way that Paul tells slaves to treat their masters. Not because it's a law to me, but because of the principle of it so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. A slave's behavior should adorn or make the teaching of Jesus attractive to his master. This is done through behavior, being well-pleasing. This phrase is frequently used in the Bible of people living rightly before God. Uh, sometimes it's translated pleasing and acceptable. If you live this way for God, you should live this way for your worldly masters too. And not argumentative. We should avoid talking back to persons of authority, children to parents, employees to bosses, slaves to masters, man to God. Don't talk back not pilfering or stealing. The word means putting aside for oneself. This is the same sin that Ananias and Sapphira were guilty of in Acts chapter 5. But a slave should be showing all good faith. A slave should be trustworthy and dependable. <clears throat> Last couple of verses in this chapter. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let no one disregard you. This is Paul's theological motivation behind our actions. The reasons for why we pursue self-control in our lives, the reasons why we renounce our former ungodliness, it is the reasons behind why when the world sees us, they see something different and it catches their eye. We're no longer Cretans. We're something entirely new. And our lives should reflect Christ every day. This is a beautiful passage. And I encourage you to come back next week as we dig into it. Thank you for your attention.